Well, there is much to talk about. Let's get to our panel. From Rio de Janeiro, Tim Vickery is a journalist and football expert here in our studio. Chuka Onmechili is a professor of communications at Howard University and a football enthusiast. From Los Angeles, Nigel Boyle is a professor of political studies at Pitzer College, also a big fan of the sport. And from Moscow, where the action is, Artu Petrosian is a football journalist. Welcome to all of you to the show. Artu, let me start with you in Moscow, where all the action is happening. Uh, as we've been reporting, a great start to this World Cup, a great start for Russia with that uh, victory over Saudi Arabia. But, uh, and I know it's very late in Moscow right now. What's the atmosphere like there? I've never seen anything like that before in Moscow. Obviously, there's so much joy on the streets. Uh, obviously, this is the biggest sporting event in the country, maybe after the Olympics 1980. Uh, the streets have changed massively. People from all over the world are now here dancing, singing all night long. So you can imagine how it all looks like. And, and sure, surely, right. after such an impressive 5 0 victory, yep. Go ahead, go ahead. Surely, after such an impressive 5 0 victory, all Russians are now uh, uh, joining in in all the songs, especially from Peruvian fans, which you mentioned a few minutes ago. So uh, the atmosphere is fantastic in the city. And Artur, the city itself has been transformed, isn't it? I saw one newspaper report said that Moscow has been radically transformed for the event from what it was 10 years ago, just a decade ago. It's now looking like another city. Yeah, that's true. For like a famous song goes, Moscow never sleeps and we can now feel it. I heard some complaints from my colleagues, some, from some foreign colleagues today at Luzhniki uh, saying that they could not sleep. They live, uh, they stay in the center and they obviously, it was obviously so noisy outside that they could not sleep. Okay, let me go to Nigel Boyle. He's in Los Angeles. And Nigel, before we get to what is going to be actually taking place on the football pitch, I'm going to talk a little bit about the politics surrounding this particular event there's been it's been overshadowed uh, by politics um, you know we haven't seen this this much of politics getting involved in the sport for a long time but we had a british member of parliament who's calling for england uh, the english players to wear black armbands in a protest against russia we also had the sports gear company nike uh, refuse to supply cleats to the iranian team citing uh, united states uh, sanctions and a number of world leaders have said they're not going to be attending this event in in Russia, a number of them have also been saying that they haven't made up their minds yet. Is this fair, given that this is a sporting event? I'm not sure that it's completely unprecedented. I think these sorts of things have happened at previous World Cups where, uh, in the run-up to World Cup, there have been concerns over the, the, the particular regime. And so, obviously, um, Putin is at odds with uh, the United States, with Europe and others uh, uh, right now. And so, uh, uh, there's, uh, there's some friction over that. But um, I'm pretty confident once the, uh, the World Cup gets up and running that the focus will be on the, uh, the, the games and the, 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 the story of the tournament um, and um, uh, I think uh, a lot of this um, um, political furor will, will sort of die back. And certainly it is a big showcase for the country hosting it, isn't it? Definitely so, uh, and uh, obviously it's a, it's a great boon to Putin and uh, to, the, to the current regime in Russia, um, but uh, um, the World Cup really matters, and uh, uh, we're all very happy here in California here today because we're going to be uh, co-staging the 2026 World Cup, which is going to be a, big, very, a very big deal for North American soccer, so, um, but I think all regimes that get to host World Cups uh, benefit from it, and uh, uh, this is why. Uh, they pursue it. Yeah, already looking forward to that. Chuka here with me in the studio. Let's talk about the event itself, the tournament itself. And let's talk about the African teams uh, at this year's World Cup. Five African teams in Moscow for the World Cup, Nigeria, Egypt, Senegal, Morocco, Tunisia. There have been some experts who've been saying uh, none of these teams will make it to the last eight. What do you think of that? <laughs> 
I remind you that uh, it's not unusual for experts yeah. to look down at the African co uh, right. competition. And, and I think one of the issues is really also based on the FIFA ranking because African teams are ranked lower. And it's a good thing that uh, the ranking system is going to be changed after the World Cup. But in my own opinion, I think there are at least two African teams that stand a very good chance of getting to the next round in spite of their ranking. Um, I would say Senegal, for example, uh, in Group H, they have a good chance. Then you also think about Nigeria. However, Nigeria, they, for them to get there, it's really going to depend on the game on Saturday when they play Croatia. Uh, but even though I talk about these two teams, I think personally that the best African team is Morocco. But unfortunately for Morocco, they are in one of the toughest groups. They have to play Spain and Portugal. But I think it's, it's anything is possible. Um, really, to be honest, I think Africans are expecting at least one African team not just to get to the quarterfinal, but we could see some real, real surprise if somehow we're able to get to the semifinal itself. You didn't talk about Egypt, because one of the best players in the world right now, Mo Salah. Yes, they, they're a very good team, but uh, it's going to be tough. I mean, as you mentioned earlier, with Russia's victory today, 5-0, Egypt really has to be able to beat Russia in Russia. Right. And it's going to be a tall task. But as you mentioned, Salah is a key. Uh, he was a key during the qualifiers, and they, they're just going to need him. He's coming back from injury, so there are going to be questions about fitness. But I think uh, that if they overcome Russia, they could make it. But it's going to be a tough task. It's not going to be easy. OK, let's go to Tim Vickery. He's in Rio. Uh, Tim, Brazil play their first match against Switzerland on Sunday. And much is expected of the Brazilian team for this World Cup. That's after the ignominious 7-1 defeat to Germany in the last World Cup. So uh, what are the changes this time around? What are you expecting? Well, the bar is set very high. You know, it's been 60 years since a South American team last won the World Cup in Europe. That was Brazil. Uh, what they have now, as well as outstanding individual talents, they have a coach with a modern tactical idea. Now, I think we're seeing one of the structural problems with football at the moment is the dominance of Western Europe. We're seeing that with the dominance of Europe's Champions League. We're seeing it at international level as well. Of the last six World Cup finalists, five have come from Western Europe. Western Europe congregates the best players in its club football and most of the good ideas as well. But Brazil have a coach who's armed with a modern tactical idea and this, together with the individual talent of the Brazilian national team, means that they go into the World Cup with a justifiable place amongst the big favourites. And Tim, tell us more about this tactical uh, strategy, this new tactical strategy from the coach. We know that Brazil's got a very strong back line. The defence is very strong. What else uh, do you see happening? Well, what, what uh, the coach Chichi has brought to the team is he's made them much more compact. They're compact, the players close together. That makes them harder to play through defensively. But it also means in possession, because they're closer together, the man on the ball has more options for a pass. So this is a Brazil side who are better in possession than a lot of recent Brazilian teams have been. Now, it looks as if they're going to start off with a new, if you like, magic quartet with Neymar, Gabriel Jesus, William and Felipe Coutinho all starting together. We will find out in the course of this competition if they can get away with stacking the team with so many attacking players. Uh, and that while Brazil may not win the World Cup, but I have a feeling they're going to remind some of us of why we all fell in love with that yellow shirt in the first place. And uh, whether or not they win the World Cup, I think we're going to have fun finding out. Chico, you want to say something? <laughs> yeah, I'm just wondering about the Brazil team. How do you see them, team, in terms of looking back at the 1982 squad? That was really very good to watch, but they didn't make it. The Italian team beat them. How, do you, how does that team compare with this team that, you ha that you're talking about right now? Tim? It's an interesting com a comparison, I think, because uh, uh, Cesar Minotti, the great Argentina coach who won the World Cup in 1978, and he has made the comparison. He has said, this Brazilian side, the way that they move the ball reminds me a little bit of the 82 side. Perhaps the current side are not quite as good in midfield, 
but I think they're defensively more solid. So uh, it, it's, it's an interesting comparison. Um, I'm also very, very keen, switching South American sides, I'm very keen to see Argentina, who yet again have been drawn in the same group as Nigeria. Now, Argentina uh, have Lionel Messi um, playing what may be his last World Cup, and he looks fit and he looks fresh, but they have a defensive unit with a tendency to collapse like an old man into a deck chair. And when they played Nigeria in a friendly in November in Russia, Argentina were leading 2-0, but the defence collapsed and they ended up losing 4-2. They will meet again, and that's one game that I'm very, very interested to see. Artur, of course, these are national teams playing for their countries, representing their countries. That They will be individual players who will be attracting a lot of attention, as Tim pointed out. Lionel Messi is one of them, Ronaldo another. Who should spectators be watching out for at this World Cup? Uh, well, uh, I have to first of all mention uh, Alexander Golovin. Uh, in my humble opinion, the man of the match today, who made the difference for Russia, uh, who probably after Andrei Arshavin looks the most skillful Russian player, and I think he's got a bright future in Europe. As for other players, uh, I would look at Tom Werner from Germany, Nobody really is talking about him as a contender for the Golden Boot, but uh, <laughs> I think he's a real contender to get it. Nigel, one of the top teams in the world, Spain, they've been having a few problems. The uh, Spanish changed their coach one day before the start of the, the tournament. Now, that must be unnerving for the national team. Do you think it's going to have any impact on their performance in Russia? It could, um, but uh, Spain has yeah, such a strong so. playing squad and they've played well together. Um, I think uh, uh, that they'll probably um, perform well. Sometimes uh, an eruption like this uh, immediately before the World Cup uh, um, can actually galvanize a team. So I, I don't see is it that it will directly affect uh, Spain too much. Although I do think that's a very interesting group. Uh, I think both Iran and Morocco uh, could pull some surprises. So I think that's a group that could see some, uh, some shocks. What are you expecting from Spain, Chuka? I think Spain, I'm, I'm really concerned about, um, you know, the coach being let go at this time. I was really surprised. Um, it's a tough decision to take. But I don't know that I would have taken that decision uh, just before the World Cup. Uh, in my own opinion, I think mm -hmm. that that's going to destabilize the team uh, because you're going to have a new person in charge, even yeah. though he's been with the team. But the, you have to think about the psychology of the players. So I think Spain, I had them before as going to be one of the four finalists, but I don't, I mean, four. Uh, semi-finalists, yeah. but I really don't think so right now. Um, so I, I really, my it, my estimation of what Spain can do is a bit dampened. Artur, you wanted to say something about the Spanish team. Go ahead. Yeah, I think this is the group where we could see surprises. A, f a few months ago, uh, there was no question about two teams qualifying from this group, but now we can see that Spain got internal problems. There was Tensions between players, Real Madrid players wanted to keep Lopetegui, others were not so sure, so uh, it could cause the atmosphere inside the team. Portugal have been far from their best recently, and if we're talking about Morocco and Iran, both of them are great defensively. Morocco haven't conceded a single goal in the qualifiers. Iran didn't concede a single goal until the last game when they were already qualified. So uh, anything could happen in this group and I would not be surprised to see even both of these teams qualifying, Morocco and Iran. Right. Tim, getting back to your point uh, on new tactics, new uh, strategies being adopted by Brazil, if we look at Brazil and the makeup of the team, in fact, we could also do this for Argentina, uh, of the big contenders for the Cup, these are two teams which have some of, they're among the oldest squads in this World Cup. Uh, so on the one hand, lots of experience, but uh, is it also going to be a challenge? 
Yeah, I think uh, one of the problems that Argentina have had is a lack of renewal. They used to be wonderful at under-20 level. Under-20 level produced a conveyor belt of talent for their senior ranks. But their under-20 sides have been very poor over the last decade. And this has filtered through to the senior side. Uh, and it means that you've got a team which is very, very dependent on Lionel Messi. The alternative to that is Uruguay. Now, Uruguay have a solid core there. They have a group of players, I think seven, who were in the, uh, the 2010 squad that reached the semi-finals. But they also have promoted a lot of recent graduates from their very successful mm -hmm. under-20 side. They've really renewed their midfield. And suddenly, a lot of people are talking about Uruguay as possible dark horses. The group looks relatively straightforward. I and mean, we've already seen Saudi Arabia, who don't look particularly good at yeah. all. So a lot is riding, I think, for Uruguay on their game against Egypt, the next game in this World Cup. But Uruguay could be a team to look out for in this World Cup because of this blend that they've got of an experienced core together with some exciting youngsters. Nigel, let's look at England. Always a huge following for the English team. Uh, it is the only team that's going to be at this tournament where all 23 players in the squad are based in their own country, all play in the English Premier League. Uh, does that give them an advantage? Well, the English Premier League is very strong, so uh, that helps. Um, but um, uh, generally speaking, I think it would be better if there were more English players playing in some of the continental leagues. Um, so um, uh, uh, expectations, I think, are suitably low this time for the, for the England team. Uh, and they have a relatively favorable uh, group situation. So uh, they may be able to, to do well. But, um, but yeah, uh, it's interesting that there are a couple of very young England player, English players who are now playing in the Bundesliga and elsewhere. And I think that will be beneficial for the national team to have uh, that kind of variation in, in, uh, in uh, experience among players. Shuka, if we look at the African teams, uh, you've written that you know, the African teams uh, have often blamed bad refereeing uh, for their bad performance. Uh, why is that? I think uh, over the years, uh, there have been some calls that you look at and you wonder about those calls and they make a difference. Uh, one particular one, I believe, was in 1998 uh, when Cameroon played Chile and two goals were mysteriously cancelled and they didn't look offside. So that's why I had written that, you know, the, VA, if the VAR, it's something that's welcome for African teams because I think it creates a better level ground. Um, even if you look at 2014. The VAR is the video. The video uh, assistant, assistant referee. referee yeah. yeah. And if you look at 2014, there were also some complaints in the second round when Nigeria played France. Uh, so the African teams are hoping that with this right now in play, the VAR, that it's a more level playing ground for them. So uh, we are not saying they're <laughs> going to win the World Cup, <laughs> but yeah. there is more hope that there's going to be some fair play on the field itself. Yeah. Uh, Tur, uh, let's talk about Russia, the host country. Uh, you know, as we've said, a great win in the opening match. They have home ground advantage, of course. Um, what do you expect from them? Uh, to be honest, this morning, not everyone was uh, even confident that Russia would win tonight. You know, uh, so many internal problems in the team. Uh, Russia lost two, two center backs who would normally start. Uh, lost uh, one of the best attacking players, Kokorin. Uh, Cherchesov, uh, the manager, didn't call up the best holding midfielder in the country because he fell out with him, Igor Denisov. Russia hadn't won for seven matches before today, had only one shot on goal in, la in the last two friendlies. So mm -hmm. there was not uh, much space for optimism before today. But obviously after today, the atmosphere got better in, in the team. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, with one like the team is already in the knockout stages, if they manage to at least draw against Egypt, in the next match, yeah. the chances are very high to, to go to the knockout stage. Tim, we haven't talked about Germany. This is the top-ranked team going into the World Cup. Uh, do you think they could go all the way? I, I certainly do. Uh, I'm a little bit worried by Germany, especially because they seem to have some problems in the camp, and their form going into the World Cup hasn't been particularly good. 
that's when you really need to look out for the Germans. Last time, four years ago, it was one of the great World Cup wins. It's the first time that a European side has ever won in South America. Uh, they had three games in the group phases at, phase at one end of the competition in very hot conditions, a game at the other end of the country in cold conditions. Then they had to beat the two South American giants in South America. It was a wonderful World Cup win, and they haven't rested on their laurels. They've brought some new players through. They used the, the rehearsal events last year, the Confederations Cup, to do that, and they won that as well. So I'm worried by the Germans coming good on the night. And if I have to make a prediction, and usually I only like to make my predictions after the event because they're more <laughs> accurate that way, but if I have to make a prediction, I, uh, my money would be on the Germans. Shuka, what do you think of Germany's chances? I think their chances are good. Um, of course, I think Tim mentioned some worries that people have about the German team. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I remind people is, if you think about Germany, the team that came to the Confederation Cup that was played last year, this wasn't really the A team, but they came and they dominated people at that Confederations Cup and won the Confederations Cup. I think Germany, forget about the friendly internationals. Those are friendly games. I think when the competition starts, the German team would be the German team. I fully expect them to reach the, the final four. I don't know whether they would win it, but certainly in my mind, I think they are the favorite team. But, you know, Brazil would have a lot to say about that. Nigel, if there was going to be any kind of major upset in this World Cup, where do you think it's going to be? Well, a couple of teams like Peru have been identified as uh, uh, possible dark horses. Um, uh, but uh, I think if you look at a lot of the groups, uh, it's possible to see a number of different teams getting through. And um, I've always liked the uh, South Korean team. And that's a team that, that the core of them play in the Bundesliga in Germany, and they're really strong. So, so that's a team that's not being tipped by many people. But I could see them uh, getting through to the second round and then uh, beyond. But uh, um, but I think a lot of the groups, uh, there's uh, sometimes one outstanding team in the group, and then with the other three, uh, you could see any three of them, uh, of the three of them going through to the second round. So I would expect uh, quite a few, a few upsets. Tim, uh, looking ahead, way ahead to 2026, when that World Cup's going to be held right here in North America in three countries, three host countries, uh, there will be 48 teams. How does that change the World Cup? Well, I regret the idea of staging it in more than one country. This time it will be three countries. And one of the things that I love about the World Cup that uh, I really felt four years ago was that thing of concentration, that thing of bringing the world to one place, bringing the world together. And now, as we just saw in that wonderful report from Peru, people travelling for the first time to follow their national team, people who've never been outside their country before, having the opportunity to get together. Uh, so I regret the lack of focus it will have in a World Cup played over three countries where everyone is not in the same place. I'm also a little bit worried about the increase to 48 uh, for two reasons. One, the structure of 48 doesn't work as well as 32. Right. You know, because you go 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, champion. 48 is a little bit more unwieldy. Uh, and I fear that we might have more games that are as one-sided as the game between Russia and Saudi Arabia. Chika, do you agree? I, um, I think I disagree a bit. And here is why I disagree. Um, let me just go back in terms of looking at the results and saying the World Cup is watered down or it's not the best World Cup. I would like to remind everyone that when we had 16-team World Cup, we had scores that were like 9-0. Uh, mm -hmm. We had 7-1 against Haiti or 7-0. Then we had 24-team World Cup. We even had the highest score of 10-1. So I think these are things that happen in the World Cup. It doesn't mean that when you have 48 teams that it's going to be watered down. If you think about it, there are some teams that are quite capable of playing in this World Cup that are not there right now when we have 32. We have the United States, we have Italy, we have Holland, we have Chile, uh, we have the Ivory Coast. So there are a lot of teams that are not here that if we had a 48 team, they probably could be there. Then the, the other things that you also want to look at is 
that when you look at the 48 team World Cup, right. I agree with team that is a little bit unwieldy uh, because you have a situation that could be a problem, which is if you're going to have three teams in each group, yeah. then you're likely going to run into a situation where the last group game, one team is sitting and doesn't have the advantage of the two teams playing in the very last game. Mm -hmm. And that could really present a problem of match fixing and stuff like that. So I, I do agree with Tim in that case that the structure could be a problem going and forward. Really, yeah. Well, we're almost out of time, but I've got to do one more thing, and that is your predictions for what happens in this World Cup. We'll start with you, Chuka, in the studio. Uh, you mean who wins it? Who wins it, yes. <laughs> I would stick with Germany. I would stick with. I would say Germany will be the f um, the first team since Brazil yep. to win two consecutive World Cups. Okay, Nigel. Um, I think Tim is right to point out that West European teams uh, will likely predominate, and I think the best uh, playing group uh, among the West uh, the, the European teams is France. So I'm going to predict France. So we've got Germany, France, Artur. What's your prediction? Yeah, I agree with uh, Tim. I will go with France, too. Okay. I think this is their World Cup. All right, and Tim, you get the last word. Well, I think we're moving towards a big four. Uh, France, Brazil, Germany, Spain. And these predictions, they never really survived contact with reality. But you pin <laughs> me against the wall, and I will say Germany. OK, we'll ask you for those predictions after the tournament, OK? <laughs> Great. Uh, thanks to all of you for being with us. That is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.